We are here in California on Star Wars with Carrie Fisher. And I would like to say hello because it's been a while since you were in Toronto, Canada, on the stage of the Royal Alexandra Theater in Irene. Five years. Is it five years? I was young then. And you're yes. younger now. I get younger all the time. I just finished saying to you that without the ruby red lipstick that Princess Leah wears in Star Wars, you look much softer. Well, that's not my fault. What about the earphones? Yes, yes. They may bring back Mickey Mouse. <laughs> they won't bring back anything else. Will you tell us something? As a woman who recently, in speaking with the New York Times, was talking about her life and her career and pointed out that you wanted to live and work in New York because you were serious about acting. Did I say Are you living in New York City? Yes. But Why I, are I, you in New York? I live in it because it's much more conducive for me to studying. I have difficulty getting around here. You know, you drive 20 minutes to buy a paper. And it takes a... You really have to be disciplined. It's like a rainy day with nice weather out. You really have to make your own plans and stick to them. But in New York, you just go outside, get on a bus or in a cab, and you get to where you want to go. And they have great cannolis there. <laughs> Nothing above and beyond serious acting. It's really the best cannolis in the United States, I would safely say. Carrie, what propelled you to London? Were you at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts? Studying? No, I was at the Central School of Speech, of speech and, and Drama. Drama. It's like that, except the Central School is a three-year course, and Rod is two. I didn't complete the course there, as you can probably tell. But uh, it's, it's one of the few places that really does a condensive study period. You know, they do about a 12-hour day. And it's a lot of actually what I guess is the equivalent of English training, you know, literature and poetry. And I was a 10th grade dropout, so I'm going to re remain sort of sophomoric for the rest of my life. But uh, so it did give me somewhat of a formal education in that respect. But I also, I wanted to go to a school. It was act, they don't have acting schools, you know, banging lockers, passing notes, and cheating on tests. Can so. I share something with you? Because I'd I'd like to to remind you of something and ask you if several years later, a lot has changed. In 1975, February to be exact, you wrote a poem, mm. and it was quite a moving poem. Your poem was called Hollywood Kids, and I'd just like to read a part of it, although I know all of it. And you wrote, be kind to children of movie stars driving around in their foreign cars, their sun-tanned, sun-glassed faces, their petty, smooth disgraces. They fell from a golden womb only to collide with a precocious gloom. Were you writing about yourself? Are you now exempt from that poem? Uh, I hope so. At this point, I am. I'm having a lot of fun with Star Wars. I think that, that one, when they grow up in a show business family, because they're around adult parties and so on, you become sophisticated, which has nothing to do with being intelligent or anything else. It's just kind of mannerisms of adults. And it, you grow up too fast. And that's the only problem with it, I think. A lot of the golden wombs, people come from platinum ones. Look at Liza Minnelli, you know, it can be better than that. I don't know. I had somewhat of a problem at some points, but uh, is there, writing, is there writing beyond the poem, Hollywood Kids? No, that was it. Well, I've been working as an actress lately, but I have that was, that was kind of a fluke. A friend of mine had it written, and also there was poetic license in there. I, gloom might have been too strong of a word. I just was rhyming. With, I don't know what else it was. I, I'd forgotten about that, conveniently enough. Does, does New York, does living in New York give you a perspective, living in New York, studying in London? give you a perspective of California and the entertainment industry you could never have had at home? Yeah, I think, I think I have had that advantage of having kept away from L.A. for long, long periods of time. Since I was 13, I, I haven't really lived here for a long time, and I think it can, it can be a little bit of a problem. I would probably be a backgammon expert and a tennis pro and so on, and I would have missed out on a lot of other things that I think are more fulfilling. I don't know, you know, I... I I think it's, it can be very narrow out here. What I, where I was living, I, I certainly don't feel that about a lot of people certainly lead very full lives and, you know, and, and manage to live out here as well. The weather's great. I agree. I spend a lot of time out here, though. It's the only place you can get work. I love doing films, so I would have to spend a lot of time out here to do that. Okay, Star Wars is playing in theaters all over North America and soon the world. We know that you work in shampoo. We all know the scene that people remember you for. What about the future? Star Wars is, is in theaters. What about Carrie Fisher's work from now on? Well, after I finish this, I'll probably go back to New York and 
pick up with my studies unless I get work. I'm up for a couple of things, that ambiguous state that a lot of actors are probably in for half their careers. But uh, yeah, I'm hoping to get some work. Above with whom are you studying? I study with a man named Michael Howard sometimes. There's a coach named Marilyn Freed who I study with. I have cooking classes, dancing. I do are you fencing? all of the dilettante things. I was never very good at fencing in school. I took it at Central. But uh, I, there aren't that many parts where it would call for, I think maybe Joan of Arc carries around a sword, but that's as far as she gets with it. I'm all right with it but I was never very good. Will you tell us, I've, I've been asking several of your associates, what, what do you think it is about Star Wars that is bringing out the child in all of us? Why are we stomping and cheering? Bad guys night? and good guys. A very distinct, I think, you know, two different uh, classes of those people. That you get so many loser films now. I don't, you, go to, you used to go to films to escape. You used to go and think, Fred and Ginger and Rita Hayworth and Isn't It Lovely. Now you go and you think, Thank Christ, there's no shark chasing me, or I'm not about to kill a politician, or there's no car behind me that's going to eat my children. You know, it's a different kind of escapism, and I don't think it's as much fun. And I think that it's that it's time for that anti-hero thing to sort of take a back seat to the fun in films and so forth, to be able to lose yourself in it in a good way, and not just think, oh. That's really awful. My life is a peach compared to that, you know, which has happened so much, I think. All right. I want to thank you for speaking with us. Okay. I want to thank you for being able to meet the woman several years later who wrote the poem Hollywood Kids. Oh. And to find you a different person, at least different from the one that I thought was presenting herself in that poem. What did you Wiser. think? Oh, I thought I, I, just, I just find you, quite obviously, older, wiser, more experienced, and someone who knows what she wants to do. I think that's about four years ago, I think. I don't know. I'll have to look at it. fast four years <laughs> and five years since Toronto. It's hyperspace. I thank you very okay. much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Carrie Fisher, Star Wars. We'll be right back with more. Wait a minute. Now I want to see him. Where did you get <laughs> Mark Hamill is with us. We are at 20th Century Fox. We're talking about Star Wars. On is, this, is this part of the set? Western set? Well, I, first I thought it might be Tatooine, my desert planet, but it looks like an old Roy Rogers movie. But we have Hollywood rubber rocks here. We want to make you feel right at home. I do. It looks very Canadian. <laughs> it's not quite the Canadian Rockies, but th there's a semblance of something familiar. I want to talk about the film and yeah. the effect that it's had on you, because we know of the extensive television work. Yeah the soaps, the dramas, right. everything that you've done, that right. debut in 1970 was Bill Cosby? That's Bill right. Cosby show. Right, I had two lines and it got me my SAG card and uh, I basically made a nice living in television since then. Uh, only a few things stand out in my mind as something I'd really want you to see. You know, I mean, you can uh, count on one hand really because we deal in quantity. In this, yeah, they crank that stuff out. Uh, I did Sarah T with Linda Blair, which was, I thought, a wonderful script by David and Esther Shapiro, and uh, played Patricia Nielsen and Eric. Meeting the, the people that you get to meet and traveling, like, that's the most fun. And in Star Wars, I got to go to Africa, I'd never been. I got to go to England, and had never been. So, uh, in a way, the job paralleled the character in the script because I was being swept away in an incredible adventure in movie making, courtesy of George Lucas. And Luke is swept away in a fantastic adventure, you know, light years from Earth. When, recently, when you were talking about the role of Luke Skywalker and your director, screenwriter George Lucas, who we know gave us American Graffiti before right. Star Wars, you equated yourself with George Lucas and suggested yes. that Mark Hamill and Luke Skywalker were indeed George Lucas. I still believe this very strongly because George is uh, like a, a kid that is so smart they put him in college at age 11. He still he's, loves toys, comic books, 
uh, I think he sat down and thought, well, what would I like to do? I mean, when he wrote the character, well, I get to swing across with the princess. I'll write that down. You know, uh, I couldn't help. Carrie brought him, Carrie Fisher came back to America for about a week and then came back to England and bought him a Buck Rogers uh, liquid helium pistol or something, some 30s toy, little space gun. And I'm not kidding you, Brian, he was running around the halls zapping, couldn't, you couldn't pry the thing out of his hand with a crowbar. Uh, he's really delightful, he's a shy man and uh, took me a, a while to get to accept his rhythms, but once I did I was completely comfortable with him and I think in a project this spectacular you need somebody that you can just completely trust because so much of it you know we didn't see. Um, the hologram, they would just put a piece of tape on the ground or when I'm working with the remote and the lightsaber it's all just pretend. Yes. And uh, in a cutaway cockpit, which they're rocking slowly, there's nothing but blue screen. And you have to imagine the TIE fighters coming in and the Imperial Star Cruisers or whatever. And then to see it in a theater and see that the, 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 the John Dykstra and his special effects men, ah, uh, I, I had no idea. I'd seen photographs of the models and so forth, but I mean, well, remember at the beginning of the film that star cruiser comes in yes. and fills the screen? I think that's one of the greatest hooks in the picture, yes. because right away you say, okay, folks, this is it. Um, it's only this long. I mean, it's, and in a way, George didn't want reporters and everything to see. You know, it's like a magician being careful about giving away his tricks. Yes. But I can tell you that you see the models there. There's no way you can conceive of how it's going to look. It, it really is. Uh, over 900 people worked on this film. So when people come up to me and say, I love the movie, it's hard to say thank you and feel justified. I want to pull out a list and show them the other 948 people. Well, when you all accept your awards, you can thank everyone <laughs> and have a special ceremony to thank the 900 people who helped make Actually, Star Wars. Actually, if any actors walk away with any awards, I think it'll probably be Chewbacca and 3PO. <laughs> we know about the success of Star Wars, and it's a yeah. phenomenal hit. Yeah. What has it done to your career? What is Mark Hamill working on or approaching? What's next? Well, um, I'm doing a film called Stingray for uh, two classmates of George, George's. One was just before him in USC and one was just the year after him at USC. Now they've written like Sugarland Express and Bingo Long and MacArthur, but it's their first outing as a director and producer. Now they had seen uh, rushes of Star Wars and everything, didn't think I was quite right because it's a real character. It's a contemporary? Yes, it's a contemporary. You're back on Earth. Yes, I'm back on Earth. I'm going from starships to Stingray Corvettes. It's about a kid that's so obsessed with automobiles that he really is he's emotionally dwarfed in everything else. And uh, George kind of steered them in the right direction. I mean, they, he, I think they suggested, uh, he suggested a, something to look at. Uh, so that I was able to test for, for Stingray. And I'm really excited about it because, like I say, it's from going to from this kaleidoscope of magic to a, a very real um, human uh, contemporary. Well, movie. I have to thank you. We're getting a cue. I thank oh, you for Star Wars. I wish we could talk. We get longer. to Canada. You're in yes. Toronto. We'll I'd continue. love to. I'd love to, Brian. You're really invited. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Pleasure. Nice talking to you. Mark Hamill, Star Wars, and we'll be right back with more. That was fun. So fast. Yes, it really was. Well. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, Brian. Oh, hey, and I have a list of nine hundred. Call me Harrison. Thank you. What can we do for you? We are rolling. We are rolling. Yeah. All right. I just want to establish that we are here in California at 20th Century Fox. You are Harrison Ford. We have seen Star Wars. And I, I'm interested, you know, when it, in looking at a film like Star Wars, you wonder, as one did with a film like Kubrick's Space Odyssey, where, where the actors figure in the imagination of a filmmaker like George Lucas. Do you ever feel 
in retrospect, now that the film is playing, yeah. is a tremendous success, that it's the film and then the actors? Do you, think, oh, yeah. do you think he gave a lot of time to thinking about characterization of actors versus the effects of the yeah. film? Well, I, I think George is a spectacular filmmaker. He, uh, he wrote the script, of course, you know. And uh, I think he created characters that are almost actor-proof. And I think that's the way it works. He doesn't have a lot of communication with the actor after he's, uh, he's chosen. I mean, there are specific things. But you'll never get George to explain to you what it is that you're supposed to be doing. Uh, he just uh, defines by, uh, by his script uh, everything you really need to know, and you just... Uh, get in there and go to work. I'm curious about the actor who left, was it, you left Wisconsin. Yeah. You were working in Laguna Beach, California in that production of John Brown's Body. Right. And the, the story is, we have to find out how much of this is apocryphal and the publicity department creates a man's background. Yeah. But you were doing that production of John Brown's Body and someone at the Laguna Theater. Yeah was responsible for your receiving a contract with Columbia Pictures on what was then the new talent program. Right. Was it a seven-year contract? Yeah. Did it surprise you that your debut in film was as a bellboy in Dead Heat on a Merry-Go-Round? I no. mean, after doing John Brown's no. body? No, it didn't surprise me at all. I mean, it, it's a, it was a whole different medium, and uh, of course you had to start at the bottom work out. But you, you couldn't have stayed for seven years because you were very quickly working with Universal and doing a feature like Journey to Shiloh. They, uh, they didn't really want me to stay. <laughs> I lasted a year and a half at Columbia. And uh, then I went under contract to Universal and I lasted a year and a half there. What, what happens to a man emotionally who, knowing that he's having, having chosen as precarious an occupation as that of actor, yeah. marries the year after he's out of college, yeah moves to California, yeah. and in, in the midst of all of this, you temporarily abandon acting, and you're working at Carpentry. Yeah. I mean, why the total abandonment of acting as a craft? Um, well, I, they drove me crazy. I mean, I drove myself crazy. The situation was too much for me to handle. At the, I, started, I was a baby actor. I was 21 years old. I didn't know anything about acting. Suddenly, I were an actor. and. Uh, I couldn't, uh, what I couldn't deal with were the relationships between me and other people. I, I, could, I, I probably w couldn't do the work as, as well as I should have been able to do either. I mean, you've got to learn uh, from experience. But uh, I wasn't able to, uh, to deal with people as well as I should have been able to deal with. Harrison, where, where was your wife, Mary, in the middle of all of this? I mean, was she a woman right. who was not Beside in a profession? Me. No. She, she was a civilian? Yeah. Did she understand what you were going through as an actor? I think she understood what I was going through as a person. But I, I don't know. She never knew another actor. But uh, it's the same for everybody. I mean, I don't think that acting is such a strange profession. I think you, set, you face the same challenges and uh, vicissitudes in acting as you do in anything else. But how in the middle of, the, of this chosen profession as a carpenter did American yeah. Graffiti, <coughs> excuse me, well, the I, character I, I, Bob Falfa yeah. in Feedy, how did that come into your life? Well, I realized that I was not going to have my second child delivered for free the way that my first one was because my Screen Actors Guild health insurance had lapsed and I had to go back in the business and make at least $1,200 to have this child for free, the way the first one was. So I contrived to get back into the business for a little bit. And then I realized that I really wanted to get back into it completely. This was but I've continued to do carpentry for the, the, probably two or three years after that. On a professional level? I mean, you were yeah. working as a carpenter yeah. for other people? Yeah. Running my own jobs. Why are your sons named Benjamin and Willard? <laughs> I mean, is, are, is, are those family names, or are uh, they? No, but no? It, it does prove that there's a God in heaven, <laughs> if we can have jokes like that on Earth. I, we, those movies weren't out yet when, when I named those kids. You know, we're, we're here because of Star Wars, and yet, while well, Star Wars is playing in the theaters all across North America now, as we talk, you have the Coppola film Apocalypse Now, you have a film you've just finished with Henry Winkler and Sally Field called Heroes. Directed by Jeremy Kagan. Yeah. Right. Is, do you, 
feel that you've arrived? I mean, do you feel the success that you should be feeling right now with that I kind feel, of work? I feel uh, much calmer than I have in years. I have the opportunity now to, I have a little financial security. I'm able to make a choice of my next project uh, on a basis that I've never enjoyed before. That makes me feel good. What, what's your role in Apocalypse Now? I play your... an intelligence colonel, colonel in an ar in army intelligence. Was all of your work filmed in the Philippines? It was, yeah. Hot and nasty. Not like California, no, where no, it's just like hot that. and yeah. intermittently nasty. <laughs> and in Heroes? What are you playing Heroes? Uh, I play a returning Vietnam veteran, a uh, uh, Missouri farm boy. What were you doing in summer stock in those early years? Uh, was it Williams Bay? Yeah, it was. And you were doing musicals and drama? Yeah. What kind of roles? Oh, roles completely out of my range. Reverend Shannon in... Uh, oh, Night of the Iguana? Night of the Iguana. Uh, Captain Billy in Little Mary Sunshine. And, uh, Joe in Damn Yankees. That, that I would have been right for. But I got the opportunity to do things that I, I never would have gotten a chance to do in more professional situations. It was good for me. You're going back to the stage? What happens to the stage-trained actor who finds himself successful in film? Can you afford to go back on the stage now? I can now. I couldn't when, uh, when I was uh, during the last 12 years. I could make much more money as a carpenter than I could as a as a, an actor in the Are stage. Are there any play. plans to go back on the stage? Are you I'd reading like very scripts? Much to. I'd like very much to. But isn't, isn't California not I mean, I, I'm not minimizing the fact that the Huntington Hartford, the Amundsen, and, and the Westwood Playhouse and all that's happening out here, but well, there's not. it seems to be notoriously not a theater. I think that's a misconception. There's a lot of theater here, and, uh, and a lot of it very good. Well, there's always Stratford, Canada. I have to thank you for speaking to us. Thank you very Pleasure. much. Pleasure. Harrison Ford.